Thanks, Marley. So we've got a great panel today of local leaders in the area who have been focused on values-based procurement in their work. Um, we can, so we'll have an opportunity to have them present for about 10 minutes each, do some questions, a round of questions that I'll ask, uh, opportunity for some questions from folks via the chat, and then potential time for some small group conversations as well at the end. Um, but I'd like to start uh, with Kathy Chan, uh, Cook County's Health, Cook County Health's Director of Policy. She provides leadership on policy issues that impact Cook County Health patients as well as special in initiatives that address social determinants of health. Thank you, Kathy. And then also Alessandra Kuhaney, the South Metropolitan Higher Education Consortium. Um, she's the Small Business and Circular Economy Manager. Um, SHMEC, which is the acronym for the consortium, is a unique partnership of nine higher ed institutions extending from the south side of Chicago, west of Joliet, south to Kankakee, and east to the Indiana border. And their members are a mix of two-year, four-year private and for-profit degree institute granting institutions. And then Tara De Clemente, the manager of health promotion in the Office of Student Health and Wellness Nutrition Support Services um, at, C at Chicago Public Schools. CPS serves over 360,000 students at over 650 schools. And Tara leads the district's efforts to support schools in establishing healthy school environments through implementation of over 50 health and wellness policies. She's been a strong leader with us on the good food purchasing policy adoption within the school district and also um, as a participant within the Urban School Food Alliance, uh, which is a group of the largest school districts uh, feeding programs as well. So thank you all for coming today. Um, well, why don't we start with Kathy and if you could give some of your background and your work with Cook County Health and Hospitals as well as your membership within Westside United and you can talk through the work there. Great. Well, thanks so much, Roger. Um, pleased to be part of the presentation today. And I've got a few slides that um, I am going to share with this group. Just give me one second. Um, can you guys see my slides? Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today is just provide you with a little bit of an overview of Cook County Health um, as an institution and then talk a little bit about our role with Westside United. And of course, interspersed throughout my presentation, I'm going to talk about um, how all of these things are uh, trying to connect with local food purchasing and kind of the spirit of the panel today. <clears throat> so. I always like to start any presentations that I make about the health system with just our mission. Um, so we have a longstanding history uh, in Cook County of being a provider of care, and that is regardless of a patient's ability to pay. And in this day and age, it also is, um, is regardless of whether somebody has access to insurance or not. Um, so we're really proud of that mission. We continue to serve that mission. Uh, the other two parts of our mission are um, not as well known, but I think equally as important as our role as serving as a provider of care, which is really to think about these partnerships that we uh, should be engaged in and must be engaged in if we really want to work towards a healthier Cook County. We can't do this work alone. I think um, a lot of the food work that we have just started to do um, is just an example of that, is that uh, while we may be experts in the delivery of healthcare, um, we need to work with experts in other areas such as food, um, uh, housing, other social determinants that really more so might affect the health outcomes of our patients. And then the last one is really um, the, where that speaks to me, which is uh, just my role here, which is really advocating for policy is um, at a broad base that protect the physical, mental, and social well-being of the people of Cook County. <clears throat> Um, this is just a slide that illustrates the types of facilities that we operate. So most people know as Forest Roger Hospital, which is our flagship hospital um, on the near west side. We also run a hospital on the south side of Chicago. We have a number of outpatient centers, um, community health centers. We provide correctional health services at the jail and the juvenile temporary detention center. 
we run the health department for most of suburban Cook County. Um, and then we run County Care, which is a Medicaid health plan serving uh, Cook County residents who have Medicaid. <clears throat> This is just a service map. So obviously Cook County is a very big place. We have um, a, Kathy, a number I'm of facilities. So, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your slides haven't moved from your front slide. Oh, that what is we're weird. Um, let's see. It says my screen sharing is paused. Let me try it again. There we go. OK, sorry about that. Um, uh, this is just a map of our facilities, um, just, you know, again, another visualization. And then uh, this is a snapshot of some of the work that we have done to address food insecurity at Cook County Health. So we have partnered over the last four or five years with the Greater Chicago Food Depository, as well as others in the anti-hunger, um, anti-food insecurity space to address the issues of food insecurity. We screen our patients and health plan members for food insecurity. Um, we've advocated for policy changes that increase access to healthy, affordable food. And then through the leadership of our own health department is um, we've been taking a comprehensive look at opportunities for alignment with good food purchasing, um, both within our institution, but also thinking about now some of the partnerships that we've um, begun to engage in and thinking about how it, there might be opportunities to share the GFPP pillars with these organizations, um, including with Westside United, which I will transition to next. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Westside United, um, Westside United is a collaborative of hospitals that serve the West Side of Chicago, as well as a number of other community organizations, businesses, uh, other stakeholders that really seek to build community health and economic wellness. Um, in, in a set of West Side neighborhoods. And the overarching goal of West Side United is to close the life expectancy gap by half um, within these nine neighborhoods by 2030. So I think most people on this, on this uh, Zoom call are aware that there's a pretty significant life expectancy gap between the loop, central Chicago, and if you just go about a dozen um, L stops to the west, that there's a significant um, disparity when it comes to life expectancy. And so while some of that is driven by health, um, we know that health, again, doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? That it's health contributors to health are all of these other social determinants, including access to healthy food, access to safe communities, access to good educational opportunities. So um, the a number of anchor hospitals, including Cook County Health, Rush University Medical Center, UI Health, Lurie Children's Hospital, Amita, and Sinai, and Sinai have all uh, joined up in Westside United to pursue a collective effort to reach these goals. Uh, the areas that Westside United is focused on really focus in four impact areas, um, economic vitality, education, health and healthcare, and neighborhood and physical environment. Um, and so economic vitality uh, and health and healthcare is really where some of the opportunities around um, GFPP and local purchasing fall into place. With economic vitality, one of the strategies in helping to work towards the overarching goals of Westside United is leveraging the hospital's um, kind of large purchasing power, both in terms of the number of people that they employ, but also the money that they spend, um, and try to keep it focused within these Westside communities. Um, and setting forth a plan to do that. Uh, obviously, with health and healthcare, the delivery of healthcare services is really important. But um, uh, the, the the health and healthcare, and then and then the neighborhood and physical environment also um, fall into the work group that I help co-chair for Westside United, which is healthy food access. And this work group has really been um, focused on this issue of how do we increase access to healthy food that is affordable, that is accessible to Westside communities as a way to improve health. And um, also with kind of this last strategy that's listed on this slide around a fruit and veggie voucher program, um, how do we also tie it to opportunities for economic development and um, building economic security for businesses uh, and other entities that might also be providing these services and, and these goods for Westside residents. So tying them all together because access to healthy food is um, one, you know, getting access, 
providing access to healthy food is just one component. If we can figure out how to also link them to um, uh, keeping it on, on the west side, uh, helping to employ west side residents, um, it, you know, it's a it's a it's a circle that we can kind of help promote um, and, and keep on the west side. Uh, so all of this work has just started. Um, you know, we are really on the uh, very much in the early stages, both at Cook County Health and thinking about some of this work at Westside United. So um, in terms of what we are thinking about and what I can share today is that, uh, again, through the leadership of the, our Cook County Department of Public Health, we've been doing um, kind of an environmental, we, we've been doing an assessment within our own institution about where are we purchasing food, where are we purchasing food from, where are those opportunities that exist where we could uh, look at how we um, procure uh, and incorporate aspects of GFPP into those contracts in the future. As a uh, public hospital system that is part of Cook County government, um, you know, we do have to think about the special um, rules that we have to follow as a public entity in our contracting processes. But I think as we've seen other municipalities and other governments around the country that have adopted GFPP, including um, the city of Chicago and its various departments, you know, it's not, these are not insurmountable challenges, but they do require changing the way that you are thinking about this and not necessarily just saying no to new ways of uh, perhaps um, going about this work. Uh, I'll also add that um, in healthcare, I think that while COVID has really thrown everything um, for a loop this year, especially when it comes to the uh, economics of running a healthcare institution. I think that this has also obviously been coupled with all of the civil unrest that's happened and just the uh, shining a light on the inequities that exist within the West Side and other communities throughout Chicago and Cook County. Um, and despite the fact that um, hospitals and other healthcare institutions may have slimmer, um, slimmer dollars to work with when it comes to thinking creatively about this. I, you know, I would challenge all of us to, you know, this is this, we have to, we have to start doing better. Um, and so even though the economics may be challenging at this time, you know, we, we also, there is a, a great amount of, um, uh, of support in thinking about how we write these inequities, how we really challenge some of the systemic racism that's been in place. Um, and so I, I think the food issue, because it's so apparent, because it's been made so apparent, um, there are some real opportunities uh, to at least continue to move forward. It might not be as fast as perhaps it would have been had COVID not happened, but I also um, you know, have hope that, that there's still some momentum behind this. Um, so uh, this is just my contact information and um, uh, the website for Cook County Health as well as Westside United if you're interested in learning more. Um, and I definitely look forward to the breakout sessions and hearing from my fellow panelists. So I will turn it back over to Roger. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. So moving to Alessandra, uh, please let's hear more about uh, the work that you all are doing with Schmeck and where you all are thinking about moving towards. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so let me see if I can share, it says the host disabled screen sharing. Let's see. Oh, there we go, let's see if that works. Music or computer. Um, okay, I do not get an option. Um, to actually share my presentation. Um, okay, let's see if we can do it. Marley, okay. are you able to share it or do you, should I pop it up? Sure, I can share it. Great, okay. thank you. Great, thanks Marley. And I'll just kind of uh, 
try to remember to point you to the next slide. Um, Just one second here while I um, bring it up on the screen. Yeah, sure, not a problem. Um, so while you're you're doing that, Marley, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. And um, I have a, a slight correction to the really amazing title that Roger gave me that sounds super cool and exciting and I would love to be that. Um, but um, I'm actually the executive director of SMEC, which is not nearly as fascinating. Um, so I may have to change that. Uh, but um, I don't, let's see. Um, so while Marley's pulling up those slides, okay, great. Um, I'm assuming if I can see them, everyone else can see them. Um, so a little bit of this is, um, might be some repeat from Roger, um, but SMEC is a membership-based organization with, um, we ha currently have nine members. We lost a few members, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and budget cuts. Um, but we're um, made up of, um, degree granting institutions, we are a combination two and four year members. Um, and the way that SMEC itself operates is through a number of committees that's defined by our President's Council, um, which I'm actually going to go through in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to give you some of the numbers. So when we're talking about the, the potential impact that our higher education institutions have on the region, you can kind of see it. Um, so all of these numbers were pre-COVID and I do um, emphasize that because um, COVID has changed everything um, for our higher ed institutions. And a lot of people with um, us moving to virtual have, um, we've had increase in enrollment in some inst institutions and decrease in others. So it really, hopefully in the end it balances out, but we are dealing with that. Um, but we do employ more than 11,000 individuals um, within our South Metro region. Um, and we actually educate 80,000 students annually. Um, and then combined with all of our members, we offer more than 700 certificate and degree programs. Um, so Marley, if you can go to the next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so um, as I mentioned, the way that SMEC operates is through um, various committees. Um, and those committees are basically um, created based on the institutional needs of each of our members. Um, so we try to focus on where everybody is needing the most help to really leverage the power of the consortium and the expertise within the net network. Um, I will tell you the one committee that is not listed here, which um, has not officially been formed, um, but I would be surprised that if by the end of 2020, it is not as a diversity and inclusion committee. Um, and the reason we don't have one is because we do talk about that in all of our committees, but I think that with everything happening in 2020, we've seen a real need to actually pull this out and separate it um, and talk a little bit more in depth about that. So um, I think we'll be seeing the creation of that committee coming up soon. Um, but we do have a committee that focuses on career service um, and how we work with our employers in the region and um, take our students through the pipeline from um, their first day at college to a job after graduation. Um, so that committee is super active. Um, our academic officers are really great. They help us with all of our programming and um, meeting the needs of the current economy. Um, our chief information officers, I will tell you right now, um, I don't think they have ever been busier um, than they have been since March when we all went virtual. Um, so that has been fascinating to see. We have a crisis management committee. Um, they, when, when they were first created, they were really created um, to talk about responding to active shooter situations. Um, and since then we have seen them expand that and really look at um, other crises that happen on campus. Um, so, Living in the Midwest, we do have natural disasters. Um, so they have plans set in place and how our institutions can help with that. Um, and most recently, um, and this was actually prior to COVID, um, they talked about how we may respond to any type of major disease outbreak. And I will tell you in 2019, when we really started looking at this and updating our plans, we really thought it was gonna be the measles. Um, so we were somewhat prepared. Um, 
but then I don't think anybody could have been prepared for what happened with COVID. Um, but they've just been really active and they've been really great kind of keeping keeping everybody in check and responding and making sure that our faculty, staff, and students are, are staying safe during this um, pandemic. Um, we've got a library committee, marketing committee, um, and then um, the committee that is near and dear to my heart is our sustainability committee. Um, and our sustainability committee is really what I'm um, going to focus the remainder of the, the presentation on. Um, so our sustainability group actually started in 2009, uh, and it was our um, our president's council that said, um, as higher ed, we have a responsibility to address sustainability in our institutions, and we have a responsibility to um, mentor our communities. Um, and so they started forming um, this committee. At the time, some of our colleges had full-time sustainability professionals, um, and others were just um, kind of put within that other duties as a sign category. Um, and they started meeting and really talking about how to, how to green their campuses and um, how to promote sustainability to our students and how to integrate sustainability into our curriculum. Um, and they really, I would say, were the group that started the discussion around equity before anyone else. Um, and so that was just really great to see. Um, and so before I was in this position, I actually had the privilege to be a sustainability coordinator at Prairie State College. Um, and, and so that might be the, the reason I have such a per personal passion for the field. Um, so part of the, the work that the sustainability committee um, did is they, not only did they work with on their campuses, they started doing outreach with their students and engaging their students in green jobs and green careers and um, talking to students about what they could do at their homes to be more sustainable. Um, and then they started to reach out to the community because they just realized they, they were just this wealth of knowledge and there were municipalities out there that wanted, wanted to do stuff in their communities and they didn't know how. Um, so we started to, to reach out to them and Marley, if you can go to the next next slide. Um, um, I'll, I'll talk about link and leverage um, and this link and leverage initiative, um, which began in 2014. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that these slides will be shared after. If not, if you put your email in the, the chat box, I'll be sure to share it with you so I don't have to go through this. Um, year by year, but in 2014, um, we as a sustainability group started to do a lot of reach out to our communities to see who was doing what, who needed help, and what help we could offer. Um, and since then, we have been in our communities um, helping. Um, we've been providing resources. We've been sharing potential grant opportunities. We've been convening large groups of citizens to help them understand certain topics that they could then go back and, and talk to their mayors and their trustees about. Um, each year we, um, we grew our initiative. Um, and in 2018, we formally introduced a um, sustainability network in Will County. Um, and in 2019, we formally introduced a Prairie State Regional Sustainability Network. And what those two networks did was essentially split our region in half to address sustainability initiatives that specifically affect those communities. Um, and then we meet on a larger scale where we, we talk about it. And the, the, region, the reason we split um, actually had more to do with county boundaries than anything else. Um, and even though we, as people, flow back and forth easily, um, government regulations do not in Illinois. Um, and so what we ran up against was a lot of, well, something was happening on this side of the street in Cook County, but it was much different in Will County. And so we had to split up for that reason um, to kind of expand some of the work that we were doing. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with Lincoln Leverage. We started bringing um, a lot of um, the work that we're doing with Cook County, which I'm going to talk about in a, few, um, in a couple minutes, um, but around good food purchasing, 
what we started to do was replicate what was happening in Cook County in Will County. Um, we were making really great progress. Um, we were engaging um, many, many citizens, um, many farmers um, in Will County that had not previously been part of the conversation. Um, and then COVID hit and everything just kind of hit this wall. Um, and everyone's just trying to figure out like how to move forward. So for the past several months, we've been just trying to, to figure that out and our higher ed institutions have moved, uh, I hesitate to use the word moved slower, um, but have been more cautious in reopening than some of the other businesses in the area. Um, so because of that, um, we are all virtual, um, and if we're not virtual, we um, are not um, able to do um, events on campus. So, Marley, if you can hit the next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, in 2019, we actually were able to partner with um, the Cook County Department of Public Health through their ISPAN grant. Um, and this is where we really got to focus on our good food um, practice purchasing um, and do an environmental scan of our institutions to find out who was doing what, what their current purchasing practices were, um, and where we might be able to offer some technical expertise. Um, we, once we kind of did that environmental scan, we did host a face-to-face -face workshop to review those results um, and discuss the next steps for actually getting um, GFPP adopted throughout our higher ed institutions. Um, we're currently, um, we had planned a student sustainability summit. It was originally planned in April. Um, it has been postponed and will actually be held virtually in two weeks. Um, and the goal of that summit is to engage our students in good food purchasing practices um, and empower them to advocate for the implementation of GFPP on their home campuses. Um, and so that I'm so excited for that opportunity um, because um, in higher ed, change usually becomes um, imminent because a student requested it. Um, so through that, that event, we're hoping to give our students the skills and tools needed to make that change happen on their campus. I um, mean, we've also um, partnered with CCDPH to talk with our key stakeholders in adopting GFPP and what that means um, for our institutions and who all needs to be involved. Um, higher ed, um, it's not just one person to make a decision. It's typically um, a group of 10 followed by 10 other groups of 10 um, before anything moves forward. So we really want to make sure that we're um, engaging all of our stakeholders throughout the way so that um, there are no um, surprises when we um, come up ahead. Um, and so next slide. Great, thank you. Um, and this is the, the last slide. So um, just kind of what the future holds. Um, so individually, our institutions have been working on different um, items with food access and um, different cultural meals on campus. But collectively, this is the first that we've really tried to do it um, on a large scale and working together. Um, so right now we've got, like I said, our student summit is planned um, in the next couple of weeks. And then we are looking to um, hold a second webinar um, specific for our stakeholders, our finance directors specifically on actually adopting GFPP. So when we do return to campus physically at some point, um, we're able to implement some of those practices. Um, and then because I, as I mentioned, everything that we're doing in Cook County is working on being replicated in Will County. And we are currently working with the Will County Board to actually adopt GFPP in Will County, similar to the way um, Cook County adopted it. Um, so that, that concludes my presentation. Um, so I will turn it over to Roger and obviously I'll, I'll be on the line if there's questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Those are exciting developments. Um, and knowing that it's been a huge, well, across the board, a challenge for all the institutions this year, but great to hear the momentum is still going. You guys are relaunching the student forum and the other work as well. Thank you. Um, so switching to Tara De Clemente with the Chicago Public Schools. Um, all right, you're ready to go. Thank you. 
Yes, these um, you get to be a little bit of a new skill here with the virtual meetings. <laughs> Um, hopefully you all will be able to hear me. I have the luxury of hearing some jackhammering on my roof right now. So the soothing sounds of work from home. Um, but thank you all for attending today. And thank you, Roger, for uh, including CPS in this um, great discussion today. I'm Tara DiClemente, as Roger said, and um, we have a unique role where I'm in two departments at at CPS. I'm in both Nutrition Support and the Office of Student Health and Wellness, and um, we work very collaboratively. We think of the school meal program as the cornerstone of wellness in a healthy school environment, and so we really try to merge those two works, work streams together um, to make sure that our students have healthy food at home and that we're helping to build those healthy habits. A little bit about CPS. So we are the third largest school district in the US. New York City is number one and Los Angeles is number two. Um, we have historically, we're waiting for our new enrollment numbers, um, but we have historically served about 350,000 students. We have 642 schools and 400 school gardens. I always like to include gardens in our farm to school and GFPP work because we really are working to create an additional food system within our schools and helping our students to learn about growing and um, having that healthy food access right in their own yard and school. We are primarily a low income district and so what this really means is that we're eligible for the community eligibility provision, which is an amazing program um, where we can provide all of our school meals at no cost to students or families. So we don't have a free and reduced rate. We are on 100% uh, CEP and so all of our students can participate in meals and it's been really great, uh, particularly of course when COVID first hit, we were not having as many challenges with tracking meals. Um, of course, if you're following all of the hot school food news uh, and it's ever changing, this is now available to all school districts during the pandemic. We normally serve about 70 million meals per year, and so we're getting a lot of great accolades for all of the meals that we're serving during COVID, but we are only serving about 50% of what we normally do. So when you think of other institutions that are struggling, even though we are providing many school meals each day, we are seeing a financial impact uh, based on low participation. In an average day last year, right around this time, we were anywhere from 360 to 380,000 meals per day. On a good day right now, we're at about 120,000. So we're definitely seeing a dip in participation and really hoping that there's some other food access programs that our families are accessing. If they're not, or if anyone wants to share, you can go to our website. We do have over 400 sites open every day for families to receive meals, and they actually get multiple days of meal kits so that families don't have to keep coming every single day. So our GFPP timeline, uh, I wanted to just lay out kind of where we started because I know other I know when we talk to other institutions, sometimes it can seem overwhelming of where to begin. And it's important to note we did not begin with adoption of GFPP in a policy. We began with a lot of other small, small but big steps uh, in the grand scheme of things to sort of build this foundation to make the pitch to our leaders and to be able to build it into policy. But uh, one really big decision we made in September of 2017 is that we switched to all of our chicken being NAE, no antibiotics ever. Uh, we had been working on a cross standard um, responsible use of antibiotics, uh, but we, weren't, we just weren't seeing the progress being made that we wanted to. And so we really wanted to switch to NAE and uh, worked with our, our food providers to be able to make that switch. Uh, we also, before making this full switch, had already been accessing a local NAE chicken drumstick that we were serving two times a month. Local in the district, I did not include this, um, but we consider within 350 miles from Chicago. We have to go pretty far just to even get out of the city. Uh, so that's why the number um, when we started, we made 
the local radius right within 200, 250, but then as we started to grow our local economy, we needed to make that a bit bigger. Um, but we get that NAE chicken from uh, Miller Farms in Indiana. We were also committed to local fresh frozen produce once per week and then fresh twice per month. So um, fresh frozen, just uh, f uh, flash frozen. And so it's as fresh as it can be, but frozen. And we're able to afford that and hold that at a better rate than the fresh. Also uh, primarily, as you know, in the Midwest, peas, carrots, uh, corn, all of those things are uh, you're getting those frozen. It's very rare you'd be getting those in fresh as a major food provider. And then our twice fresh local, typically uh, it tends to be an apple, but we're able in s September to get some plums. We've done um, some berries in the past, so it really just depends on availability. A really big um, but great an important challenge in our district is that we've committed to, if we have it on the menu uh, from an equity standpoint, it's available to all students on that day of service. So we don't want to have super small serves all across the district. If we have a product, we need to have enough product to serve the entire district. So sometimes that uh, limits our options a little bit as well. We also have pretty high nutrition standards. We've committed to no reformulated products. So when you think of um, parents making decisions at home, I like to use cereal as an example. Sorry to pick on any cereal manufacturers or folks here, but uh, when you think of a, sweetened, a sugar sweetened cereal that you can buy on the shelves in the store, if a parent doesn't want to serve those types of foods in their home, we don't want to have the same product but made just for school um, because you can you may know, or if you can imagine any unhealthy food, they can make it for school. <laughs> they take all the sugar and fat and salt out of it and label it school food. Um, Flaming Hots is a great example. You can find a compliant Flaming Hot that you could serve on your menu, but we're very committed to not serving those types of products. Uh, we also developed an ingredients of concern list where we're trying to get some of the top um, identified harmful ingredients removed from our items. We worked with School Food Focus on this and the Center for Science and Public Interest. And so we do have an updated list that I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested that we've made our own and added a few other things on based on our learnings. And so all of this work built up to us being able to adopt the GFPP um, as part of our local school wellness policy in April 2017. So we brought that to the board um, and we were proud to be able to adopt this as the Board of Ed, which then helped the city to be able to go on and have this. Um, when we think of GFPP in the city of Chicago, we're one of the biggest food procurers and meal service um, with a budget in mind. So when you think of who purchases a ton of food, the Department of Aviation and the airports, but we've all spent $14 on a salad at the airport we do not have that luxury in school food. So um, we really were that test point for the city. Some of our successes, so we do, we did have a baseline report and one update. Um, we can certainly, we have not shared those publicly, not for any reason other than it's kind of a lot to explain. And so we're not trying to keep them a secret, but um, if someone's particularly interested, let me know. Um, but we, we found that just by turning in our data and having it analyzed, we then realized things we were not tracking on our end that could account for GFPP. So when you think of cage-free eggs, we kind of knew we were doing that. It wasn't something we promoted, but that really helped with our GFPP score. So that's something we, we track. We look for all of those extra benefits. We found out about producers that had great environmental practices, um, producers who had great labor practices. And so you find all this out by getting the report back, seeing what's missing, and then actually asking the questions. So we really have some enhanced data tracking. We launched Meatless Monday, fall 2018. Um, so that was exciting. I'm a vegetarian, so I was very excited about that. 
we're really trying to have a little less cheese as the vegetarian option. So when you do look, we are still feeding children at the end of the day. So you see a lot of pizza sticks and grilled cheese and um, we're really trying to work on, as you see in the next point, those plant-based protein recipes. So we have a lentil sloppy joe that was set on the menu for the week after we went to COVID break. So it did not get to launch, but we did try it. It was a chef inspired recipe. Um, it's very good and we look forward to having our students back to serve hot meals to put that on the menu. And we did have a tofu lo mein that we launched in January and students actually really loved it. Um, and it was really a fun experience because we also got to introduce tofu to some of our dining staff who had just never tried it or always been a little bit nervous about trying it. And so we got to have a lot of fun with that. And then one thing I think is very big, um, some of you may know, is that we work with Aramark as our food service management company. So there's a lot of benefits to that. And then there's a lot of idiosyncrasies as well. And so when you think of the vendors that we're coming back on our report with the highest labor violations. We are, those are a vendor of our vendor that we're under contract with. And so, and a lot of them are a vendor of a distributor that's a vendor of a vendor of a vendor. So when you think of us sending something directly to a company, we had to have some discussions to just make sure that everybody understood. The point of this is to let everybody know we are watching this and we are responsible for the health of our students, first and foremost. And we're also responsible uh, for using our taxpayer dollars and, and investing in our own economies and in practices that are beneficial to everyone, to the earth, to the labor force, to our students' health. And so we finally got those out. <laughs> that was a very big victory. Um, a lot of questions, but we did get those letters out to vendors. And I know it will make a difference because sometimes people just need to know that you're watching that and that it does matter to you. Then for us for next steps, um, we actually already did this, but I wanted to still put it out there to let everyone know. We did an internal training. So we've had new folks join the Aramark team, new folks join our team. And so we just last week or the week before had an internal training of just what is GFVP? We went through our report, went through the action plan, just making sure everybody stays up to date with what's the goal? What are we going towards here? We will then um, submit a new batch of data We've been creatively trying to find a one-year time frame that doesn't encompass the strike, which took away like two or three weeks of meals, or COVID, or and just kind of find that balance of the one year of data. So that's fun, but we're getting there and we'll be turning that in and get our mo uh, new updates. And then just some key initiatives that have been on our mind and we're hoping post COVID we can really get back to, but we have a lot of local grain uh, producers and providers here that we just haven't engaged with and we're interested in. And then looking at more local poultry, uh, and I, I forgot to write this one, but also looking at NAE turkey products. So chicken really has moved to NAE. We all are seeing this more in our grocery, uh, but we're really looking to see those turkey providers moving to that next. And then we'll continue to monitor our local spend. We obviously know it will be lower this year just because we're not, um, per, we're not providing as many meals, but we are trying to keep on track for the percentage of where we're at, if that makes sense. And then if, if anyone is interested, this is obviously only up to date until March 2020, but um, this is actually our space where we provide all of what's the local serve, where it's from. We have information about the farmers, the farmer visits we're doing, and just our tracking. And so this is where we do keep everything tracked by the month. Um, and if you're ever interested, just check that out and I will stop sharing. Great, thank you so much, Tara. Um, knowing that it's been a, a tough transition for you all, that you all made a heroic effort to make the transition in March uh, from school-based meals to boxed meals that are going out to families, um, and then even the work you've done to even get food delivered to families has been amazing. So thank you all for all of that effort that had to happen immediately, knowing that school food is um, such an essential part for so many families in the area. 
and nationally for being able to have access to foods on a daily basis. And, and the, the crisis has really accelerated that. So thank you all. Um, I do have a few questions um, that I'll kind of rotate around. And, and if the panelists could also jump in, if it's something that I'll start, follow a quick, uh, start with this question with Tara, and then we can move down the list, the other folks. Um, but what are some barriers you know, kind of what are the largest barriers and opportunities that you all that you found as you've been working to shift procurement with an equity focus? It's a really good and important question. Um, I think you really hit it on the nose by pointing out it is equity focus and you learn through each conversation where to begin and based on who you're talking to and so I think sometimes, not sometimes, there's always a balance of we're here to feed children and what do children like eating? If you know children, they like pizza and hamburgers and chicken nuggets and chicken patties and, and they still will eat healthy foods. We do provide a lot of that, but we're always striking that balance of what are the favorites that we obviously depend on meal participation for reimbursement, which funds all of our equipment repairs, which funds all of these great initiatives we're doing. But at the same time, appealing to the idea that we have a great responsibility to the parents of our students who are trusting us to feed the students every day and feed our students, and then also to taxpayers. And so when we think of the money that we're spending, it, it comes with a great responsibility with that. And so a lot of it is just having those full conversations and really saying the reason it's important to focus on these things, it may be more work it may cause more conversations to find that market. It may cost more. But in the end, the offset is a better, healthier earth <laughs> for our students to inherit and, and pass on. Healthier food, better, uh, more money into our own economy, building that food system locally where we're supporting local vendors. So there are jobs in the economy. There is a food system career path in front of our students. Um, so I think it's being upfront that it's not easy to just say we're going to do GFPP and don't worry, it's cost neutral and it'll be the same thing. It's not the same thing. It takes more thought to it, but anything worth doing is worth doing right, as we all know. And so um, I think you're bringing up the equity and just the idea of the long-term, very positive impacts that can come from doing a little bit more work right now. Thank you. Kathy, uh, for you all, what have you found to be the barriers and opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Tara just said it all really, really well. I mean, we're at the very beginning stages of this. And I think that very early on, as we were being convened um, uh, in one of the initial meetings, there was a recognition that this is going to require us to think differently. And especially when we look at the procurement piece that we needed to think as a public institution how we are responsible to taxpayers um, and thinking about how we talk about this uh, in a way that is um, both responsive to GFPP, the pillars of GFPP, but also thinking about the dollars and cents of it. Um, and, and that they might not, you know, just realizing that it is probably not going to be cost neutral in the beginning. but when you think about what you're spending money on, um, where is the value in that? And, and making sure that the value proposition and essentially uh, how we talk about a return on investment um, could pay off in the long run. And so all of those different things, I think, again, we're very early in this. We haven't actually done anything uh, different yet. We're still in that very early stage of assessments. But I think all of those things will be uh, important to think about. And it's, um, you know, I, I think also this incremental approach and also just a recognition that things will not change overnight, that this will require building that foundation, helping to bring um, folks around to thinking about this work in a, in a slightly different way. 
um, and putting that putting equity at the center, I think, is also something that can be very powerful in how that helps radiate out to all of the other work that we're doing, whether it is the healthcare delivery work or whether it's looking internally at some of the practices like purchasing. Great. And Alessandra, from Schmeck's perspective? Yeah, great. Um, so I agree with the, the ladies that have already answered and, and would echo that. Um, one of the, the barriers for us specifically um, is because our students, so we, the way that, you know, we're all like third party vendors within the institution, so our students are directly purchasing. And one of the challenges that we have is once we get past our administration um, in adopting and implementing, we also have to educate our students because right now, many of our institutions are across from a McDonald's or Taco Bell. And so how do you, um, how do you point out that, yes, McDonald's has a dollar menu, um, but you know, what are all of the costs that you're not factoring in when you look at the, the health and what it's doing to your own body? And so we've got this whole added, added layer and this added education component for our students um, to work with them. And then also working with our food service providers to do some creative accounting and some creative food menus that do see those, that cost neutrality sooner than later um, because we know that our, you know, our students, many of them are struggling and they, they, they can't afford to eat. Um, and, and so looking at all of those pieces, um, and part of that is why we're pushing so hard in Will County to adopt GFPP, because if, if we can say the county is requiring it, our institutions will do it faster. Um, and whether, that, whether or not that's the right way of moving forward, I don't know, but I know it's the fastest way to move forward. Um, but it's, I mean, we've been working on this almost two years now. Um, and, and we've not gotten very far. I mean, we're, we're making slow progress. It's baby, baby, baby steps, but there's, you know, that's, that's the reality and it doesn't happen overnight. And there are more negative thoughts associated with the immediate cost um, that that's always the first thing that our finance directors look at, um, especially we have state funded schools. Um, so we have certain procurement laws and um, we have to go with the lowest bidder. Um, so really looking at those, those loopholes that allow us to do things differently and bring this in um, and really focusing on that education component and identifying some of those uh, negative externalities that are not considered in your upfront cost to really promote that down the line. So some of it's having to think that it is a broader, you, that these schools and the cafeterias are all embedded within these larger systems. That could mm -hmm. be just what's in the community. Correct. As well as the state government policies. Um, in terms of opportunities that you feel like? Yeah, I know I tend to focus on negative. I apologize about that. Um, I mean, opportunity just to, you know, looking at the economic impact, um, because we do have so many institutions, um, there's a great economic impact if we can make this happen. And um, we know we have um, the local farmers that we can reach out to and really support them. Um, the education component, um, I mean, that's what we as higher ed do is education. And so this is a whole new aspect of education for us. Um, and again, because we're at that college level, um, hopefully there's, um, an exponential education component. So maybe those students go home and, you know, feed some of this food to their families or, or learn about it and, and teach their children. Um, and, and so you, you start to see that. So a lot of great opportunities are surrounded by it. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll start with Tara again. How do you all, you know, how, how does CPS you know, work with your partners or you know, sub vendors to find um, suppliers, processors, producers who can help meet some of those equity goals and help move them into your value chain. Yeah, so we, um, 
We really do use that baseline report and action plan a lot uh, to reference to when we're talking to our vendors, particularly Aramark. Um, we usually have that first meeting with them. Um, Aramark contracts with a company called Farm Logics, which some of you on the, or all of you on the call may be familiar with. And we, when first having the conversation, we really laid out the attributes we wanted to start see being measured. Um, and so that was a really helpful conversation and just understanding that there's so much rich data and if you just don't ask for it, it's just not being tracked. It doesn't mean you're not doing it. Um, so I think when we, when we, when you think of, or if anyone on here is in that um, partnership phase, start with every single thing that could possibly be measured that may help you figure out the better products to pick and then you can kind of pare it down from there. I think that we definitely um, also have some opportunities to engage actual growers and so you know I have a, I work with a lot of amazing colleagues who have a lot of great ideas about this that you know post COVID we want to get back on track um, but we also have that a goal and opportunity of our more hyper local farmers or growers and how to engage uh, hyper local growing in um, or creative different ways of growing. So when we think of when we were first doing local, there were no USDA gap standards for um, aquaponics or hydroponics and now that's all changing and that's a game changer in the midwest so when we think of even just our own learning to what alessandra's point was is education and learning um, really talking to partners who can teach you um, can teach us as an institution of what we can be doing uh, so i think it's really going in open-minded and and willing to learn from others we obviously have only had this policy for going on for three years. We're not experts in everything, but surprise. <laughs> um, and so I think being open to hearing from others is another great place to be with partners. Great, thanks. Kathy, um, it's another question, and it may be, may be at the end of the exact state, but again, you know, how has Westside United and some of the other organizations or even County Health started looking at how to bring in more local vendors and suppliers into their chains. Yeah, so I mean, Westside United uh, is part of the economic vitality um, pillar of the work is 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 very much focused, hyper focused on this uh, lo local, both hiring and procurement efforts, um, and that's thinking about hiring as part of the hospital communities, those anchor institutions that um, I had mentioned uh, that include Cook County Health, um, as well as purchasing. And of course, as healthcare institutions, um, we're not necessarily purchasing, uh, you know, we're, we're purchasing perhaps some more specialized equipment or services compared to your other types of businesses or corporations. But it doesn't mean that those things don't exist. Um, and so, again, it's very much in the early stages, but it's it's asking the questions, it's measuring um, and taking account of where you're starting from and starting to set some goals, right? Like you're not gonna be able to do this work without knowing where you are and then actually setting forth some reasonable metrics to work towards. Um, I will say that I think one of the uh, things that Tara started to talk about that I, that I certainly think is, um, for Cook County Health, when we think about local purchasing for uh, food, um, really the money that we're spending the, for food within Cook County Health is focused within our two hospital cafeterias. So the footprint of that is, relative, is, is small compared to an entity like CPS. But at the same time, I, I think it also, that presents a different opportunity and a different challenge for us. We also contract with a food service provider. Um, and uh, perhaps there might be opportunities for some of those hyper-local um, producers or vendors to, uh, to partner with us because our scale is not as big as one that CPS is, right? So, so looking at a smaller scale operation, there could be opportunities once we're ready to engage in those opportunities to think about how do we really tap into this hyper-local market 
can we keep things, um, since our hospital is, uh, or two hospitals are Stroger and Provident, can we keep things in that region? So on the west side and on the south side, um, where are some, you know, where are some creative ways that we can think about that? So, uh, you know, well, well, that may be a challenge to institutions that require a larger um, or, or an aggregation of vendors, perhaps that might present some opportunities to slightly smaller institutions where the, uh, the investment could still be substantial, but there also might be different ways to plug into those to that work as well. Great, thank you. Alessandra, you'd mentioned that you guys had already had some ties to local producers. Yeah, so um, through some of the work that we've done with Will County, we've really been able to, um, to start a list and, and identify those farmers um, that are willing to sell local. Um, it's, it's been a struggle, um, but we definitely have a starting point um, for our events um that we host we typically do um offer local and sustainable food choices so our institutions and we've been doing this with our student summit since 2012 um where everything that we provide will be local or organic and so we've been kind of keeping a list of those growers and producers and so far we have had really great luck with our food service providers across the institutions have been willing to share that list and and those contacts um so i think we have a really great start um to to move forward with something um on a on a larger scale i think a lot of that would come down to our contract language and our even even before that our rfp language um and so that's where we would really need to focus is um kind of um, what exactly do we need to include in, in the RFP and whose responsibility is it to identify some of these producers? Um, and even as far as the metrics, I, I could see that being part of the RFP working together um, to do that. Um, so a lot of it for us, because we don't have anything official would be um, putting it in that first, first line um, of the RFP and then um, next step into the contract. Great, thank you. Um, ooh, all right, I've got another question and then it looks like a couple may come. So if folks do have questions who are listening in, please feel free to put a question in the chat. Um, but I have another one before jumping to those. What are you, so you all represent different government entities within different government structures. Some cases, Alessandra, it's several different kinds but you're operating within different geograph geographic boundaries, but also institutional boundaries. But at the same time, we're also in a larger consist food system locally where there could be a lot of opportunities for, for collaboration. Um, what, what do you think would be some opportunities or options there for thinking more holistically? We can start with Har again. Yeah, I can start. So we've actually been talking about this with um, the Chicago Department of Public Health, uh, Jen Hurd, for anyone who knows her, is where, and Marley are really supporting a lot of this work um, in Chicago, and Roger, of course. Um, <laughs> so we have been chatting lightly and brainstorming ideas about how even just interagency we could work together so the park district uses a vendor open kitchens and we also use open kitchens and so we've made a lot of progress with just even data collection just based on both of us using um, and there's another department that uses open kitchens I always uh, leave out the FSS thank you department of Family services and so we've been thinking about is there a strategy there and the three of us coming together and supporting that vendor and also asking capacity of the vendor and others to support and so we've we've um, very lightly started talking about that but i do think that there's opportunities number one and just getting together and seeing those common vendors but then also in the urban school food alliance uh, one of the ways we also try, we've been working together is product based so it's an mm -hmm. interesting idea of right now we're writing up a bid for a clean label French toast stick. Sounds like it should be easy enough, but a lot's going into it because it's for the, 
the 11 largest districts in the country, so everybody needs their specific spec within there. But that's even an idea that we haven't brought to this Chicago group of is, is there a product we could all seek? And that we'd say we will all buy if it's this price point and these specifications. And so I think the opportunities um, are definitely there and we're looking forward to it. And I, and I do think one, I, it's almost a joke. I always try to find the silver lining in anything. But one thing with COVID is it's really pushing us to be innovative and to really do the work because we have a totally different dynamic. And we don't have time, but we have time in a different way. <laughs> so um, just trying to figure out how to utilize this experience to support our farmers and our growers and our distributors and a lot of those local vendors. So that was very roundabout, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Kathy? Yeah, I mean, I think this is part of what Westside United can, um, can help with the hospitals. So even though uh, as hospitals, we are um, often prior to coming together for Westside United, you know, there was a lot of, there's a lot of competition and I think that still exists among healthcare institutions, but I think Westside United is an example of uh, our different institutions trying to come together around some common goals. And I think that there is some um, potential around uh, certainly the purchasing and coming together around some common issues related to the purchasing piece around the food issues. Um, so hopefully more to come in, in the near future about uh, what, some, what, what comes out of that. Great. Alexandra. Um, so again, I, I think we've covered most of it. Um, I, I definitely want to reiterate um, collaboration around um, contract and purchasing language. Um, that, that's a big one for us. Um, you know, that we need help with. Um, I mean, the, our consortium, I mean, what we do is share resources. Um, so I think part of it is just convening groups like this to share what works and share, share ideas, share success stories, um, share how we've overcome certain challenges. Um, I, I think part of it is, I feel like we're very, very siloed still. Um, and even though we're trying not to be, we very much still are working in um, our our own space. And um, I think COVID has made it easier because people are more comfortable meeting virtually now, but has also made it harder because I think meetings kind of slip by the wayside because um, it's not at the forefront. Um, so I think we just need to kind of, you know, be willing to reach out to each other and, and then pulling, pulling these quick sharing sessions um, together to, to share the successes, um, to provide education, to answer the questions that, you know, how do you go about implementing this? I'm in the very beginning phases. Kathy's a little bit ahead of me. Tara's even further ahead. So like just sharing all of those stories um, and pulling more people with us as, as we move forward. Great. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat. One is, and it looks like it's already been responded to about by Asian carp and the, the deliberate over harvesting of Asian carp as a protein source recognizes it's an invasive species. And it looks like Alessandra, you have the link, you can share the TED uh, info from Illinois Department of Natural Resources, who's a champion of Asian carp consumption. Um, and then also another question, thinking about how, as being on the quote unquote demand side of the equation within um, food purchasing, how, what could be some other techniques or programs or processes, or even the idea of forward contracting that could help support some of the infrastructure development for local farmers to be able to start thinking about scaling up and having the resources to be able to scale up to meet some of the demand that local institutions, you know, that, that's been some conversations about how a commitment could be made either, you know, individually as an institution or, or collaboratively and said, 
as you were talking about the cross buying, but then like if there's that contract to buy, then potentially a producer could use that to get financing to say, I can scale up to get this, or they could scale up to get this piece of equipment that they would need to then be able to meet the higher demand or hire folks or buy the seed or whatever it's going to be necessary. Anybody can jump in. I don't know, Tara, have you guys talked about that kind of, I know you do kind of work through farm logics, but thinking more about like, what could it look like for a contract, you know, in spring of 2021, we'll be buying, we know based on our menu, we're gonna need this much of this and. Yeah, I was reluctant to start because we've start and stopped this so many times. Okay. Um, just for, for just sure. um, obviously all the things that happen, but we, we have in the past, I can't think of, of course, we had a creative name for it, um, but we wanted to grow a local item. I can't think of what it was. Let's say broccoli. I, mean, I don't even know if broccoli grows in the Midwest. Don't um, all of you growers help me out. It grows. Great. Okay. <laughs> so we wanted local broccoli. So we were working with Farm Logics to find a grower who could grow broccoli just for us. And it's hard to disrupt a grower's guaranteed cycle of selling. So when you think of a lot of our farmers and growers, you know, they've stayed in business because they have great contacts and contracts and things. And so we, in our minds, thought, let's grow this local broccoli for next year. And a lot of the growers were like, yeah, kind of, you need to be in line. This is, we already have all of this broccoli forecast and sold. So we thought of, so that was a good learning. Um, but then the alternative was we did find a farmer in California who was willing to do this for us. So it went from this idea of it being local to now it's in California, but it is for us. But is that the point? No. So we didn't end up pursuing that growing opportunity um, because we already get a lot of our food from California and Florida. So I do think that there are opportunities, but I, uh, uh, unfortunately, just a public institution stance, we often just can't think that far ahead. Um, not that we can't, that just environment doesn't, isn't set for that. So I, I do like this idea and we have thought about it. It could be worth definitely pursuing again, just given everything changing with COVID and knowing that um, there's been so many challenges with food, even just getting off of farms, which is just so heartbreaking when you think of good food just going to waste. So um, I, I am open to it <laughs> and we've thought about it, but yeah, it's challenging. I hope Kathy or Alexandra, any thoughts there? Yeah, this is, a, and, and this is take a little bit of a different take on this question, but I also think about, um, yes, there, there, the, all the challenges that Tara mentioned uh, about um, the limitations of government, but I also think that there, one opportunity on the flip side of that is, um, and this is right in my wheelhouse, is thinking about, are there also broader public policies that we can weigh in on um, that are preventing um, the small and local growers from, uh, you know, working with with us as institutions um, and thinking creatively about how we can pursue advocacy opportunities and institutional changes, whether it's within our own levels of government or sister government agencies, or at a slightly higher level. But we, you know, for us, we have to understand. Um, uh, you know how how big the issue is. What are what the right role is for us to be playing in that? But it's certainly not out of the question. So um, it's it's that is like I said, that's kind of more in the wheelhouse of the work that I'm doing on a day to day basis. But you know, I think that there's opportunity for policy in in everything. Um, so I, I wanted to throw that out there because I do think that is a, a unique role that especially our large institutions could be helpful in playing or being an ally to. Yeah, if I could just add too, um, I, I don't have very much to add, but I think this is another one of those areas um, 
of opportunity to convene kind of those of us who have a, a product to sell and those of us who need a product um, and kind of bring us together and kind of have an open conversation like, okay, this is what I can commit to. This is what I can commit to and, and here are the terms and knowing that especially this day and age, it's, it's very hard for our institutions to, to commit long-term, um, but also knowing, well, you know, in order to, to grow produce, we need to have some type of knowledge of what you're looking for. And we have planting seasons that we have to follow. So like, here's the deadlines and what, when we need to know what you're looking for. But again, it's just that opportunity of, of getting us all together and having an open conversation. Great, thank you. So a lot of the opportunity is there um, and that the, the work is, you know, there's plenty of work to get there. And again, it's like you all have said, it's the setting the vision and the mission to get uh, to move towards and having the patience to make through the baby steps, recognizing that it's a large systems that we're having to work through. Um, that's great. Um, thank you all for sharing where you all are today. Um, we are going to shift to doing, we have a few minutes left, but wanted to leave some space for participants in the sessions, in the session to be able to get to meet a few other folks. So we're going to break into small groups and have a question. Uh, so for folks to think about what are exciting models, big and small that you've seen in supporting and growing values-based procurement. Um, Based on the group you're in, we also have a, a form that people can take notes in, jot ideas down. It's a, a Google slide deck where it basically has stickies. If I can paste, there it is. Oops. Looks like I did it twice. That you could open up in your groups and take notes in um, just to capture ideas for sharing later, or just have a conversation, get to know each other a little bit and you know, share some of the ideas that you've been seeing um, in your area. But again, thank you, Tara, Kathy, and Alessandra. Very appreciative of your time today. Um, and then Marley's going to break us into the groups now.
And for folks that are still in this main room, if there was an issue with your small group breakout session, if you want to just let me know, you can come off mute and share, or you can chat it and I can add you to another room. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Hope everyone had someone in their room with them. I saw there may have been a few issues with folks joining some of the rooms. <laughs> And we'll just give it a second for the rest of the folks to come back in. I have another six seconds. All right. Okay. Thanks. I had a great conversation with Lucy from Clock, who's also part of Westside United, and Dan, who's with Local Foods, who's a wholesaler looking for opportunities for local farmers to get into these um, institutions as well. So it was a great conversation. Anybody else have any insights or inspirations from their conversations before we wrap?
Well, again, thank you so much to our panelists and want to make sure um, dropping back in the feedback link. I'm on it. Uh, all right. Unless you have it up already. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Be... Um, please do. We're really trying to get the feedback uh, incorporated. This is kind of our first time running such a complex online virtual event. And so looking forward to hearing more about how to make it better in the future. Uh, but again, thank you, Kathy, Tara, and Alessandra uh, for the great work you all are doing. And um, everyone enjoy the rest of the, hopefully take advantage of the other sessions today, uh, this evening and into tomorrow. Um, again, thankful for the partnership with Cook County Public Health uh, to be putting on the sessions today. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye now. Bye.